Okay, get your Bibles out. Come on. Let's go before the Lord together in prayer today. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to come and speak to our hearts. Stand to your feet if you have the ability. I'm going to get down on my knees. Let's go before the Lord together in prayer. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're so grateful to come into your house. Grateful to lift our hearts and our hands to you, God. What a pleasure, what a joy it is to be in your presence. Thank you for what you've already done in this place. God, we don't want to stop there. We want to go farther with you. We want to go deeper. So, Lord, we would ask this day, God, that you would come and that you would speak to our hearts. Today, we acknowledge that the true teacher of the church is not a man, not a woman, not the young or the old, not the black, white, brown, any other color we could imagine, God. We acknowledge that today the true teacher of the church is your Holy Spirit. So welcome, Holy Spirit. Be our teacher. Be our guide. Give us your vision, your wisdom, your direction, your instruction, even the correction we need for our lives. The Lord will give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for it. God, at no time do we think of ourselves as better than anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field. So God, we would not only ask this blessing on ourselves, we would ask it for all of our brethren throughout the world, God, that are preaching your gospel and lifting up your truth this day, God. Bless the Baptists, the Lutherans, the Methodists, the Episcopalians and Charismatics, God. Bless the Pentecostals and Calvary Chapels. Bless Harvest and Oak Valley for uh, the Way and Ecclesia and Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist. God, all the great churches that are out there, we ask that you bless them, God. Bless the four square denominations and the assemblies and uh, the Catholics and our Adventist brothers and sisters. God, if they're preaching your truth, lifting up your name, God, we bless them as you would bless us. And God, also, we say a special prayer for our nation at this time. It's tumultuous times, God. Many polarizing factors in our world, God. Things that are happening, tragedies that should not take place in our land. And so, God, we lift up to you, our nation. We ask, God, that your spirit would just move. God, that you send laborers into the harvest fields, for truly they are ripe. And God, may the church be a shining light at this time. Strengthen the churches. May they have an answer for those that are waiting, Lord, and listening, God. And God, may we arise and stand and call on your name and do what it is that you've called us to to do, God, to reach a lost and dying world. Father, we love you, Lord, and we give you praise. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody in agreement said? Amen. Amen. Today, as you're having a seat, get your Bibles out and go with me to Hebrews, the 12th chapter. This is running the race part number four. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse number one. We've been in this verse for a couple of weeks now, and it says this. It says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily and snares. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, let me rewind your thinking because we took a little break last time we were together last weekend. But part number one of this series, we talked about how we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. That all the way up into the nosebleed sections, that the saints of God, those that we discussed in Hebrews chapter 11 and those that we didn't have time to discuss, that they are all around us. They're cheering us on and they're saying, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. Part number two came along, and you remember Pastor Luke brilliantly brought to us that there are things in our life that could be good, but they're not beneficial. Things that may be permissible for our lives, but we don't want to continue in those things because they would hinder our run. Things that uh, we wouldn't want to weigh us down, and that we should lay those things aside. And then the last time we were together talking about Hebrews chapter 12, we talked about the sin which so easily ensnares us. And that as we get our eyes off of the goal, as we willingly and willfully turn away, that we miss the mark and we will get off course and off track and eventually become shipwrecked in our faith if we stay on that course. Talked about how to overcome and how to avoid those pitfalls, repentance and staying on track with God. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1. Let's read it once again and see where we're going today. It says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Today, I want to talk to you about running with endurance the race that is set before you. Very important that we understand that if we're going to run, we have to run with endurance. The Bible actually translates that word endurance a different way in some of your translation it might say let us run with patience now we hate that word don't we am i the only one (laughs) i mean seriously we, we often think about patience as sitting in a waiting room waiting for the doctor to call us so that we can go into something horrible right we can go into some terrible experience and so we kind of dread patience don't we We live in a society that's instant everything, instant oatmeal, uh, you know, video on demand. Everything is right now. Your meal is in 30 minutes or less or it's free. Uh, You know, you've got fast food. Everything in in our society is automatic. It's, It's instantaneous. And no one likes to wait any longer. No one wants to be patient. No one wants to endure. And yet the Bible tells us that if we're going to run this race, that it can't just be something momentary and that we can't be impatient, that we have to run a certain way and that running is with 
endurance or with patience. Now, the original word in the Greek language is a compound word. It's actually two words that mean being under something and to stay there for a long time. It's really talking about pressure and weight and that if there was like a a large weight that we were carrying, that we were able to stay under that and handle the pressure and handle the load. Really, uh, think about it in these terms. What if we were all an army and we were fighting a, a battle, fighting a fight? And as we were fighting that fight, we, we, we saw that there was some high ground that we needed to take. If we were going to win that fight, we have to get up to that hill, and we have to take that hill. And so we fight a fierce battle. It's an uphill battle. And every inch we take, we're standing our ground. And as we continue to go on and on, we continue to take more ground until finally we get that high ground. We get that position. We fortify ourselves. But just at that moment, that's when the battle gets its fiercest and gets the most intense. And now we are going to stay under the pressure of that battle. We are going to hold our ground. We are going to endure the trial. And therefore, this is my ground. We got this ground. I've taken this ground. And you're not going to get me off this. I'm not going to let up. I'm not going to quit. But I'm going to stay under this pressure and under this trial as long as it takes. Because this is my ground. See, that's the sort of attitude that we're to have when we run. We are to run with endurance. This is not a passive attitude. This is an aggressive resistance. Saying that I won't let up, that I won't stop, I won't quit, I'm going to persist. See, we can stay under the persecution, we can stay under the trial, we can stay under the fierce battle by the grace of God. Patience or endurance is how faith will prove its persistence and will secure its reward. Let me say that again. Patience or endurance is how faith will prove its persistence and secure its reward. As we run our race, there is a a time where we're going to go and we're going to go before the Father and we're going to finish our race. We're going to finish the course and there is a reward waiting for those who will endure. There is a a, a well done, good and faithful servant that's awaiting all of us as we run our race and as we follow what God has called us to do. So we need to know how to run with endurance. It's one thing to know that we are to endure. That's, that's one thing, right? Well, all of us know that we should endure. We know that we should be patient. We know that we should go through trials and problems. But how do we do that? Today, I want to talk to you a couple of things for all of us. How to run with endurance. The first one is this, is to listen to the crowd. Listen to the cheer of the crowd. Remember, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 starts out, says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run. See, we have a cheering section in heaven that is surrounding us and that they are cheering to us saying, you can do it. You can do it. Come on, you can go. And as you hear those cries and those shouts of the people that have gone before you, it helps you to endure. It helps you to know I'm not in this alone. They endured, therefore I can endure. I want to talk to you today and just give you a little illustration of this in the natural. And many of you football fans will know what I'm talking about when I say this. And it is the 12th man. See, part of the Seattle Seahawks' success is something called the 12th man. As many of you may or may not know, a football team is allowed to have 11 players on the field at any given time. Now, the Seattle fans, known as the 12th man, are determined to use all the influence that they have, all of their enthusiasm, all of their cheering, in order so that it's like they have an extra man on the field with them. Now, the the fans in Seattle, many teams uh, have enthusiastic fans, but the, the 12th man in Seattle, they pride themselves in being the loudest and most boisterous fans of all. You can see some of them up on the overhead behind me. That one there over there on the left is a woman, I think, you know, and, and they just all are crazy, right? Here they are, shouting. Here they are, cheering. Here they are, the 12th man. Now, throughout the city, You'll see fans wearing jerseys with the number 12 on it. You'll see flags and banners with the number 12 on it, including a massive flag at CenturyLink Field itself that has been raised at every home game since 2003. See, they they make this a big deal. They're there, and they're doing something. In 2011, the fans literally shook the earth when the fans cheered so loudly on one touchdown that it actually caused a small one- to two-point magnitude earthquake. I mean, you know, that's pretty loud. And in December of 2013, a Guinness World Book of Records was established when the 12th man registered a decibel reading, that is a measure of how loud something is, a volume, all right, a decibel reading of 137.6 decibels in a game against the New Orleans Saints. Now, you might be wondering, well, how loud is that, really? 137.6 decibels, how loud is that? Okay, eardrum rupture. 
will take place at 150 decibels, okay? The noise level on an aircraft carrier flight deck is 140 decibels. The volume of the 12th man at their loudest was 137.6 decibels, and the noise of a jet taking off from 100 meters away is 130 decibels. So there's somewhere between the flight deck and a jet airplane taking off 100 meters away. That's how loud the 12th man registered at their loudest. See, when a team has fans cheering for them like that, it gives them the definite edge and a distinct advantage. Visiting teams do not like to play at the CenturyLink field. The reason why is that they get more offside penalties because they cannot hear the count. And opposing quarterbacks are thwarted in calling audibles because the rest of the team can't hear what they're saying at the line of scrimmage. I'm here to tell you today that you have a 12th man that is cheering for you from heaven. That they are surrounding you, that they've all gone before you. And here's Moses in the crowd with the big foam hand saying, you can do it. You can do it. Just keep following Jesus. You've got Joshua standing up next to him saying, be strong and have good courage just like I was encouraged to do so. You can do it. You can do it. You've got Rahab the prostitute saying, don't worry about what they'll do to you here on the earth but you can endure for God alone is God in heaven and he alone is God on the earth you've got Noah going before you you've got all of the saints of God that have gone before you and they are cheering you on right now saying rise up church keep running keep going keep enduring keep persevering be patient in the trial because we've gone before you and now we made it therefore you can keep going and you can do it you can make it your 12th man is cheering you on Come on, somebody, give the Lord a praise. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, in the message paraphrase this. Do you see what this means? All these pioneers who blaze the way, all these veterans cheering us on, it means we better get on with it. Strip down, start running, and never quit. No extra spiritual fat, no parasitic sins. For all of us, we can endure, we can make it. Why? Because we hear the cheers of those who have gone before us. Listen to the cheers of the crowd. Second thing is this, how to run with endurance. Second thing is this, is that you've got to run through the pain. You're going to have to run through the pain. You know, all throughout the Bible, we are promised trials. We are tr promised pressures. Jesus said in the world, you will have trouble. Hello, some of you guys came in this place today because you're in trouble. You don't have to believe God for it. You don't have to confess it. You don't have to go looking for it. It will find you. Each and every day, there's going to be problems, going to be trials, going to be pressures that you go through, and you're going to have to run through the pain. In a marathon, there's a phenomenon called hitting the wall. Right at about 20 miles into the marathon, they say that's the halfway point. Even though 26.2 miles is a marathon, they say the halfway point is when you hit that wall. Hitting the wall really is this, is that your body, as you run, is using up the energy supply within it, okay? And there's carbohydrates and different things that you've eaten that now supply the energy for your body as you run. And right at about 20 miles, runners experience this phenomenon of hitting the wall. Their body runs out of those carbohydrates. It runs out of the energy-producing uh, nutrients inside of them, and all of a sudden, bang, it's like they just hit a wall. Their mental capacity goes down. Their physical ability goes down. Many of them, you will see them just all of a sudden, they, they slow right down and they can't run like they used to run anymore. Many of the marathon runners tell you that at the end of the race, they can't even do basic math because their mind is just gone. They just don't have the energy. They, they can't think straight anymore. And for all of us, we need to understand that we're going to be running a race, that this is not a sprint this is not a just flash in the pan. This is not a quick thing. Otherwise, if when we got saved, if we just said, hey, all right, Lord, I'm running the race, and Jesus would just beam us up, and we could go be in heaven with him forever, and that would be our race. It would just be a quick little sprint. But no, we have a life to live. We have something that God has called us to do here on the earth, and therefore, have any of you noticed Jesus didn't beam you up when you got saved? Right? You're, you're still here, and, and there's still stuff going on all around you, and there's stuff that you're going to have to endure. And therefore, we need to make sure that we don't hit that wall. We've got to understand what our race is. In fact, uh, the original word for race in the Greek carries the idea of agony. It, the, the word literally in Greek is agon. It's where we get our word agony from. And in our lives, that race that we run, there's going to be pain associated with it. There's going to be times where we feel like we've hit the wall. There's going to be things that deplete our energies and our resources. Jesus himself modeled it for us. We can see this word agon in the Greek is often translated conflict. 
The Apostle Paul wrote to the churches, he said, you see the conflict that was in me. You can see the trials that I went through when I went to these different locations. There was a great conflict that, that took place, that happened. There was a great agony. See, there is a race that is set before us, and oftentimes that race can be agonizing as we run and as we go through trials. Now, reading up on marathons, I found out that the best way that they suggest to avoid hitting the wall is to make sure you have a plan to fuel your body. So runners in the natural, as they run a marathon, part of the way that they decide that they're not going to hit the wall is that they have a plan of either hydrating themselves or getting an energy thing. They've got gel stuff that they put in their mouth and little cubes of, uh, of, of carbohydrates that they put in there and they absorb into the body as they run. Or, or they're at a certain mile, somebody's going to meet them with an energy drink or something like that. That way they can continue to fuel their body so that they can continue to run. We all need to have a plan and know that there's going to be problems, there's going to be trials, there's going to be pressures that we go for, and therefore we have to have a plan to fuel ourselves, come on somebody, so that we can continue to run the race that God has called us to run. Jesus, like I said, modeled this for us. Jesus came and he lived the perfect life. He was all God, yes, but he was also all man. And he came and he lived in a flesh body. He came and he lived in an earth suit like you and like me. That way he could have compassion on us. That way he could relate with us. And Jesus showed us in his life how to run the race and how to endure the trials. Jesus has been living for 30 years, 33 years. Now he's had his three years in ministry and now he's coming towards the end of his race. And all of a sudden there is a wall that is staring Jesus in the face. He's about ready to go to the cross. And there in Luke chapter 22, turn there with me, Luke chapter 22, we see how Jesus modeled this. We see the plan that Jesus had to fuel himself so that he could continue to endure, so that he could stand up and stay up under the pressure that was facing him. Luke chapter number 22, Jesus is now in the garden of Gethsemane and he's praying, he's connecting with the fathers. The Bible says angels minister to him. Luke chapter 22, verse number 44, look at what it says of Jesus. It says, in being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Now, most of the time when we read this, we focus on the second part of this verse. Because that's very unusual that someone's sweat would turn like great drops of blood falling to the ground. And we think, wow, what would that have been like? Can you imagine the agony that Jesus was going through, that all of a sudden he would sweat great drops of blood? That, that would have been uh, just wild to see. That, that, that would have been so intense. And yet I don't want to focus on the latter part of this verse. I want to focus on the first part of this verse because Jesus was going through a pressure. Jesus was going through a trial. Jesus was about ready to go through a physical beating, yes, but also there was a spiritual agony on the cross that he was about ready to experience when for the first time he would experience the separation from the Father, when the Father would turn his head from him and pour out the wrath of God upon sin of humanity onto Jesus at the cross when he became our sin, when he became the sacrifice, when he became the lamb that was slain, there on the cross when he became the curse for us hanging on the tree Jesus knew that that agony was coming he knew the wall was coming and in order to go through that he had to have a plan to fuel himself beforehand and being in agony running his race he prayed more earnestly that was the plan of God that was the plan of Jesus and that's the plan for you and the plan for me Many times when we pray and we don't get results, many times when we're driven to our knees because of the pain that we're going through, when the battle gets fierce and when it goes on and when we hit that wall, we start to get away from God. We lose our wits and we lose our strength and we, we separate from God rather than run to God. But look at what Jesus does. Being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. See, our prayer life is our connection to the power source. And when you start to go to God and when you say, God, I can't do this on my own. God, I need your strength. God, I need your grace. Remember the Apostle Paul, he had a trial in the flesh. He was getting discouraged. He begged the Lord three times to remove it. But what did God say in prayer? God says, my grace is sufficient for you. See, he connected with the Father. He had a fueling program that as he was running his race, when he started to hit that wall, he connected with the Father being in agony. He prayed more earnestly. He had a fueling program program and connected with God's power to endure. We see this also in the book of Colossians chapter 1 verse number 11 in the message paraphrase once again it says this we pray that you'll have the strength to stick it out over the long haul not the grim strength of gritting your teeth but look at this the glory strength 
that God gives. It is strength that endures the unendurable and spills over into joy. Wow. Now, maybe you've heard of another running phenomenon called runner's euphoria. As runners run, oftentimes pain will start. Maybe it'll start down here in their calves and then it'll run it way up the hammies, right? And then as it continues to go up the body, it hits the gluteus maximus. But then after a while, there's something in the brain called endorphins that start to be absorbed into the brain. And those endorphins are the pleasure kind of center. They're the, they're, 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 they, they cause the brain to think that there's, there's something good going on. And it, it, in fact, it deadens the pain. So all of a sudden, this pain that was going on here no longer is felt. And they feel like they could just run and run and run and run forever. It's a euphoric feeling. It's a good feeling. There's other chemicals that go into the body that start to calm the body down and start to get the person into their stride. And they just feel like, man, I could just go on doing this forever. It takes them right through the pain. See, as you go through that process, process of pain and whatever the pain in your rear is that will you come on somebody you know what I'm talking about whatever that pain is that that as you start to connect with the father and you start to soak in his grace as you start to soak in his strength that now all of a sudden it spills over into joy and you no longer feel that pain but now you feel the pleasure of the run and you can make it through every trial you can make it through every test you can put a smile on your face and know God's got this under control I can run forever it's Spills over into joy. Turn me to the book of James. The book of James, chapter number one. James is writing to the churches, to those that are scattered abroad. James isn't just writing to them in his day. It's the Holy Spirit contains this for thousands of years for you and for me. And the Holy Spirit is speaking something to each and every one of us. Right off the bat, right out of the gate, right after James greets everybody, the Holy Spirit brings this out in James chapter one, verse two through verse number four. Look at what it says. My brethren, who's that? That's you. It's me. Right? We are the brethren. We are the body of Christ. Brothers and sisters in the Lord. My brethren, count it all. What's that little word right there? Joy. Count it all joy. Well, what do I count as joy? When you fall into various trials. Wait a second. James, do you know what you're talking about? It is not fun to go through pain. It's not fun to go through trials. I don't like pressure. I don't like stress. Why would I do that? Here's why. Because the verse isn't really done yet. Notice it's a comma. It's not a period at the end of that sentence. Verse number three, knowing. Everybody say knowing. Knowing. See, when the Bible says knowing, we ought to know something. We ought to understand this because when you understand what this is doing, what this is saying, now all of a sudden you can count it all joy when you encounter various trials. So he says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, or that is the same original word, endurance. The testing of your faith produces patience. Verse number four, but let patience, endurance, standing up under that pressure, that trial, not letting up that stick-to-itiveness, that that, that power to never quit, let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. In other words, God will carry you through this, and he will perfect that which concerns you. God will take you through that, and eventually that pain will be gone, and now you'll be able to run your race, not lacking any good thing. God will equip you thoroughly to run your race. Let patience have its perfect work. In his book, The Seven Decisions by Andy Andrews, he writes about the aborigines in Australia who were rainmakers. Now, aboriginals are known for their rain dances, but some were more successful than others, and word got around that one particular tribe was always able to make it rain. Now, when the white communities were in trouble due to drought, they began to call this particular tribe to do the rain dance. And on one such occasion, the leader of the white community went to the king of this renowned group and he says, why is it that every single time you guys dance, it rains? And the king replied, it's very simple, actually. We dance until it rains. We dance... Until it rains. We run until we win. We go until we make it. We don't stop. We don't let up. We don't sit down on the side of the road and cry. We just continue on. We put our face like a flint just like Jesus did, being in agony. We pray more earnestly. If you're going through a trial, don't stop. Don't let up. Don't quit. Keep 
going, God will carry you through every trial, every problem, every pressure. Will it hurt? Yeah. But eventually, as you connect with the power of the Father, it will spill over into great joy. And you can dance until it rains down the blessings of God on your life. Hallelujah. We dance until it rains. We stay in the pressure. We stay in the problem. We stay in the trial. I'm not giving up this mountain. This is my mountain. This is my high ground. I fought for it. I've got it. And now I'm going to stay under the pressure of the trial. Devil doesn't matter come hell or high water. I will make it through the problem. I will make it through the pressure. I will make it through the trial. Because God is carrying me through. God has given me grace. It is sufficient for the day. How? How do we endure? Number one, listen to the cheer. The 12th man is cheering for you. Second thing is run through the pain. And the last thing for today is this. Keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes on the prize. Devil's going to try and do everything he can to get you off course, to get you off track, to get you distracted. But in the book of Matthew chapter 24, verse 13, it says, But he who endures to the end shall be saved. So you've got to run across the finish line to make it. You, you, you won't get any score on the board unless you finish your race, unless you finish the course. 26.2 miles of a marathon, you only get the certificate of completion when you cross that finish line. And in the same way for all of us, this is an endurance race. And we need to keep our eyes on the prize, not get distracted. You know, when you start to get a, a, a temporary, earthly perspective, you start to get off track. Start to make decisions based on the flesh, what's comfortable to me right now. You know, I don't need this. I don't need all this pain. I don't need all this pressure. I don't understand why God would want to do this to me. That, that, that really isn't even nice, and I, I heard God was good, and therefore, if God's doing all this, then why am I even trying? And we get off track, and we get distracted. We sit out on the side of the field, and yet if we keep an eternal perspective, when we start to look to the future, and we say, you know what? This is an eternal thing. And this little light affliction that I'm going through right now, it's not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed in me. When we start to see that, you know what, if I can give up some pleasure here and now for eternal blessings, then which one's more important? When we keep that eternal perspective, all of a sudden it changes the way that we live our life. And now all of a sudden, we can endure a little bit of pain. We can do, endure the trial. Why? Because I know that I'm going to make it through. And I can see the finish line God is calling me to. I can see the glory that's going to be revealed. And that is worth far more than these temporary pleasures and joys that I'm experiencing here and now. That's why in the next verse, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 2, it says, looking unto Jesus. But that is a message for next week. How do we endure? First thing is this. How to run with endurance. Just listen to the cheer of the crowd. Number two is you got to run through the pain. And number three, you've got to keep that perspective. Keep your eyes on the prize. Did you guys get something from the word today? Come on, hallelujah. Give God a great big praise in this place. So good, so good, so good. Now, only the people in the leave early sections are allowed to leave right now. The rest of you guys, the ushers will judo chop you <laughs> if you get up at this time. And then they'll pray for you later, but we haven't taught them how to pray yet. So, But I'm going to ask everybody, please remain seated at this time. The people in the leave early sections that are volunteering, they're, they're welcome to go out there and, and go to the tables, that sort of thing. But everybody else, sit down, listen up, because your eternal life's at stake. I want to take a moment and I want to turn your eyes from the temporary, from the natural. Oh, I need to get out ahead of the crowd or I need to go get lunch. Turn your eyes from the temporary and the natural because you're going to get off course. And you're not going to make it. And I want to turn your eyes to the eternal. I want you to just think about your life. And I want you to think about eternity because we are not guaranteed tomorrow here on this earth. Just in the past few weeks, there's been a man in his 60s and just this morning, a young girl of just 15 years of age who both went on into eternity. You are not guaranteed tomorrow. You don't know which day, which breath is going to be your last. And I want to make sure that your eternity is secure, that your eternity is blessed, that your eternity is right. Because there's only one of two places you're going to end up. You're either going to end up in heaven or you're going to end up in hell. Now, sometimes people say, well, I don't believe in hell. Well, isn't that convenient? Because the Bible itself talks about how Old and New Testament, Jesus spoke of hell. And just by denying its existence or saying that you don't believe in it doesn't make it go away. You're going to have to face the reality of hell. 
And by burying your head in the sand, you won't avoid anything. Therefore, today, let's talk about your eternal life. What if today was your last day on the earth? Think about this in your heart. You don't have to answer out loud. Where would you end up? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Just think about that for a moment. Answer that question in your heart. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, all roads lead to heaven. Therefore, I know that I'm going to heaven because, you know, Jesus went to the cross. He opened up the way. It's expansive. It's wide. It's open. But could you show that to me in the Bible where it says all roads lead to heaven? Or that the way is expansive, wide, and open? No, the invitation goes out to all. There many are called. But the Bible says few are chosen. And it says the way to heaven is not expansive and wide and open. No, that's the way to destruction, the way to hell, the Bible defines for us. The way to heaven and to eternal life is a narrow road. And there are few who find it. Today, I want to shine some light on the path for you. Sometimes people think, well... Why don't all roads lead to heaven? Well, think about it this way. What if I told you all roads on the earth lead to the moon? You'd say, you're crazy. You can drive around the earth as long as you want and you'll never make it. Yeah, I understand that. So then why do we apply that to spiritual things and think it still works? It doesn't work. You can't just do whatever you want to do. I can't do whatever I want to do. We can't do what the churches out there want us to do and think that that's going to make it. There's only one way we're going to get to heaven, and that's God's way. Jesus came and he said these words. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me. That means it's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Not your way, not my way, not some well-meaning church committee's way. Got to get there God's way. Sometimes people hear that and they say, well, that's good news because I know that God lets good people into heaven. And you know, I've been pretty good. Yeah, I used to be bad, cleaned up my act. Now I'm, I'm being good lately. You know, and I, I think my good finally outweighs my bad. I've been helping out, giving money to charities getting involved in social justice causes, been nice to my neighbors. I think I've been good enough. But the problem with that statement is, could you show me in the Bible how good you have to be? Is there a grading scale or a curve, a line you have to be above behind the maps or something shows you how good you have to be? Where does it say that your good needs to outweigh your bad in order for you to get into heaven? It doesn't. Because the standard to get in heaven based on your goodness, your own merits, is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. Our goodness compared to God's goodness, the Bible says like filthy rags going to get thrown out. The Bible also tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're not going to make it to heaven just by being good. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, I I know that God's going to let people who were raised in church into heaven. My parents told me growing up, we were raised in church. We're Christians. They hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or christened as a child? Take you to religious classes like Sunday school or Sabbath school, maybe catechism class. You've always thought of yourself to be a Christian. Born in America, America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhists, not Muslims, not Hindus. We're Christians, right? Wrong. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible? Check it out. Nowhere does it say that because your parents raise you in church, tell you you're a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you wear religious jewelry, attend religious classes, be baptized or christened as a child, Or because you're born in America, that America or any other nation on the planet is a Christian nation. And because you're born in that nation, you automatically get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. And nowhere, check it out, nowhere in the Bible say that because you're not some other religion, that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. It doesn't work like that. Today, let me love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Some of you might be thinking, okay, pastor, well, I get that, I understand that. But not only when I was a child did I go to church, here I am sitting in your church right now. I consider myself to be a Christian. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to heaven? Well, no. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible says sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian? It's like me saying, you know what? I really like Dodger baseball, and I want to be a Dodger. And therefore, I go down to the sports store. I buy a Dodger uniform, bring my bat and my ball, go sit in the dugout in Los Angeles, call myself a Dodger, and think that I'm going to get to play in the game. You know what's going to happen around game time? They're going to find me sitting there, drag me out, and lock me up. Why? Because I am not a member of the Dodgers organization. It's not enough just to sit in church, call yourself a Christian. And that makes you a Christian. So you say, okay, I get that. I understand that. But you don't understand. My last church, I got involved. I helped out. I sang in the choir. I carried the pastor's Bible. Made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I even taught in the Bible classes and got a membership card. And while that's great, and I'm glad you did those things, aren't we back to good works? God's not looking for your volunteer hour sheet so you can enter the gates of heaven. God's not looking for a membership card to a church before you can enter the pearly gates. No, it's not going to work and you're not going to make it. You say, but pastor, I know God. I I know about Jesus. Celebrate Easter and the resurrection every year of my life. Sing the songs at Christmas. I could quote scriptures to you, pastor. Old and New Testament. Doesn't that mean something? Let me ask you this question. Have you read your Bible? Because the Bible records demons know who Jesus is. They're, They're not Christians. 
The Bible says the devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures out of his mouth, and yet he's not qualified for heaven. So everybody look up here at me for a second. Come on, give me some of your attention. The devil's trying to knock you out right now. The devil's trying to get you off track right now. It's fighting your mental capacity right now, trying to get you distracted. Listen up, don't let anything distract you because your eternal life is at stake, especially you guys up here in this section up here. A lot of distractions. Everybody sit down, okay? No one else get up, no one else leave during this time because God is speaking to you and your eternal life is at stake. It's not about what you have in your head, not having mental assent towards God, knowing who Jesus is, but rather this is about your heart. God has always been after your heart. Jesus was speaking to a religious leader of his day by the name of Nicodemus. He was a good guy, did a lot of good deeds, raised up in his church called the synagogue. Man, this guy could quote the scripture. He could debate the scripture. He could sing the scripture. How many of us could do that? People looked to him to find out about God. He was a teacher in Israel. And yet when Jesus comes to this great man, he doesn't pat him on the back and say, Nick, hey, hey, keep doing what you're doing and I'll see you in heaven. No, rather what does he say? He says, Nicodemus, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. And it's just that simple. That's the only way. That is the one way is that you must be born again. Now, I know sometimes people get offended at that word. They go, oh gosh, I've seen that on television. I've read about that in a book or a blog on the internet and it's weird. I just don't want to have any part of that. Listen, if you don't have any part of that, then you have no part in the kingdom of heaven. Because Jesus didn't say it's a suggested way. It's one of the routes. It'd be kind of good if he did. No, he says you must. If you want to go to heaven, you must be born again. But let's not let Hollywood movies, books, television, and the internet define for us what being born again is. Let's let the Bible do that for us, shall we? What does being born again really mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's just that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. Last book of the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church today. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, he says, I'll vomit you from my mouth. That's pretty gross, pretty graphic. But what's he saying? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and again, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today, it's your call. Today, it's your choice. I'm going to give you an opportunity in a moment. I'm going to let you know exactly what we're going to do in advance so you don't think I'm trying to trick you, okay? Everything's up front here today. And I love you enough to tell you the truth. In a moment, I'm going to give you a gift of a private moment with God. In a moment, we're all going to bow our heads and close our eyes. And what you do when you do that is you just, just get out of the physical, natural realm. You get your eyes off of the temporary. And now all of a sudden, you go in the role of the, soul, the, 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 the realm of the soul, your imagination. And now you start to think about eternity. As you're thinking about that, I'm going to ask you that question again. Where would you end up? Would you go to heaven or hell? If you answered, I think, I hope, maybe, I don't know, whatever it is, or if I identified you as lukewarm, then you need to get right with God today. And it's this simple. I'll count to three while your eyes are closed and your heads are bowed and you're considering that, and I'll pop my hands together. One, two, three, bang. So you hear my hands popping together just like that, bang. That's your opportunity to just take a moment with no one else looking around and you can look up and connect with me and raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I wanna give God all my heart. I wanna give God all my life. I wanna be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. After I count all the hands that went up, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna pray together. I'll invite you down. We will pray a prayer together and you will be born again today. Now you say, well, wait a second. Why do I gotta raise my hand? Wait a second. Why do I gotta walk forward? What if I get embarrassed? You know what? You need to get over that today. You're amongst people who love you. There's a 12th man in the room, and that's the people sitting next to you. We're excited for you. We want to encourage you. No one's criticizing. No one's judging. No one's condemning. Remember, when you raise your hand, everybody's heads are going to be bowed. Everyone's eyes are going to be closed. But even if you are embarrassed for a moment, it's better than ending up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever. We do this this way because Jesus said this. He said, if you confess me before men, I'm a man. I'll see your hand go up. Okay, I'll count it, and you can connect and, and know that I counted you, and then you can put your hand right back down, and you can close your eyes again. So he says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So today, your call, your choice. You can sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right with God. You made your choice. Or you can get right with God in this safe and friendly church service. 
all across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching my television in the foyer. Hey, if you started to walk out and then you stopped, started to listen to the voice of God, and you know God's speaking to you out there in the foyer, you can raise your hand, and then when we pray, you can come back in. If you're down at the cafe, come on, put the burger down. This is your time. This is your moment to get your hand up right where you're at. Wherever you're at on, online, across the nation, around the world, get ready to get your hand up. God sees, and God's watching, and then you can pray with us as well. Who should raise your hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise your hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Today is your day. Make sure. Who should raise your hand if you've never done this before, never said yes to Jesus? I'm speaking to you. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place and you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it? Get ready to get your hand up. I'm going to count to three in a moment. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Okay? But come on. Bow your heads. Close your eyes. This is the, that time. All right, and I want you to just take a moment and ask yourself, what if today was my last day? Would I go to heaven or would I go to hell? Answer that question in your heart right now. No one will know the answer but you and God, okay? Now, if you need to get right with God, you know that you said, I think, hope, maybe, you didn't know for sure, you're lukewarm in this place, get ready to get your hands up all together on the count of three if that's you. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands right now if that's you. Thank you. There's one, two, three. Three, four, five, six, seven, right here. Who else today? Seven, there's eight up there. Nine, ten in the family rooms. Got you guys. God bless you, okay? Up on top, give me a little wave if I can't see you right now, okay? Anybody else? Nine, ten, eleven, got you up there. Thank you. Thank you. Twelve over there, got you right here. Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Thank you. God bless you guys right here. On this side, fifteen, sixteen up over here. God bless you. Who else today? Sixteen. Sixteen wise people already. Seventeen, got you right there. Thank you. You guys, if, if, if you know I saw you guys right here, thank you. You can put your hands down. Anybody else that I did not already see? Remember, everybody's eyes are closed, everybody's head's bowed. But if, if you need to just take a look up for a second, look at me and, and raise your hand right now when I'm looking your direction. Just pop it up. There's 16 people already. And if that's you, thank you. Got you, my man. All right, thank you right here. Got you over there. Thank you. God bless you. There's 18. Where are you at? 19. Got you up there. Thank you. God bless you. 19 wise people already. Anybody else? Real quick. Don't you just feel 20? Beautiful round number. Come on, if that's you, need to give God all of your heart, need to give God all of your life. Where are you at? Thank you, number 20. Got you right there. Is there anybody else? 21, got you over there. Thank you. 22, got you over there in the family room. God bless you. Anybody else? I just want to make sure that you, you take this moment. Sometimes it takes a little while to come to that realization, I need to do this. Anybody else? If your heart's beating out of your chest and you feel that just like, oh my gosh, I, 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 and you're freaking out, chances are you just need to lift your hand. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Who else? Who else? You know, God just spoke to you. Anybody else? About 24, 25 wise people. Anybody else? Real quick, this is the last call, and then I'm going to wrap it up. Last call. Come on, you were waiting for that last call. You said if he gives one more, then I'll go. If that's you, just raise it up high. Right now, quickly, quickly, quickly. I'm going to wrap it up. Quickly, jump in. Right now's your time. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a great big praise today. About 25 wise people. Woo! Good on you. All right. We're going to pray together. You want to be included in that prayer. This is your time. Remember, I told you we were going to do this. We're all going to stand. We're going to give a clap and a shout. Twelfth man is yelling for you right now. Get hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible. A friend of you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front. If you raise your hand, you should have raised your hand. If your children raise their hand or you raise your hand in families, come on. Come on down right now. Come on down to the front. Let's pray together. Let's pray together. Come on. If that's you, come on. Jesus, if you're not my word. They're coming. Come on. You can come too from the foyer. You can come right now. Anybody else if you need to come? They're still coming. They're still coming. Hey, don't leave right now. We're getting people come this way. Come on. Let's encourage them. Let's encourage them. They're still coming. Come on. You can come too. You can come too. Everything I need right now. Anybody else if you need to come, come on. Right now. All I need is you. All I need is you right now. 
Come on, they're still coming. You can come to you. This is your time. This is your moment. Let your neighbor say, Come on, friend, I'll go with you. Everything I have means nothing. Jesus, if you're not my world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. While they're coming, while they're coming, you guys are welcome. Come on down. While they're coming, let me just give some instructions. Hey, everybody, first of all, first things first, put a big smile on your face. Okay, this is the best decision of your entire life right here, right now. Okay? This is a good thing. Okay? Now, I'm going to lead you in that prayer just like we talked about. Okay? And you're going to be born again. I don't know what God does to recreate a spirit inside of you. It's a, it's a miracle that takes place. Okay? But somehow God's going to come on the inside and that old man... You know, that old person you used to be, they're gone. They're dead. All right? Now there's a new person coming alive today. You've got a clean slate with God. You've got a new nature, new DNA, and you've got a new family. Okay? And that happens right now as we pray together. Now listen, if you fumble on a couple words, it's okay. It's not about the words of your mouth. It's about the expression of your heart right now. Okay? So we're all going to join in and encourage you. All right? We're all going to pray together. I want everybody once again bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. And I want you to just say these words out loud to God. Say, Father God. I come to you now in Jesus' name. I give you all of my heart and all my life. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Wash me with your blood. Forgive me of my sin and cleanse my past. Give me a brand new future with you from this day on. Let it be known that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That He came, that He died, and He was raised again to life just for me. Thank you, Jesus. Let it be known that from this day on, I am a Christian. I'm born again. I'm headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Come on, somebody. Give the Lord a great big praise in the place today. Woo! So good, so good, so good. All right. Now, all of you up front, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine right over here to my right, your left. This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a really good guy. Now, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? Okay. He's cool. I'm about as weird as you're going to encounter today. Now listen, he wants to give you some free stuff, some free information, free literature to find out what to do next in your walk with God. You know, when you have a baby, you don't leave him at the hospital and say, hey, see you later, kid. Hope you do all right. You know what I mean? No, you take care of them. You nurture them. You grow them into maturity. We want to help you with that. We want to be your 12th man. Okay? He'll also introduce you to some great people in the church we call spiritual personal trainers. So I'm going to come alongside you a couple of weeks and encourage you, help you get strong in the ways of the Lord so you don't go back to the old way. You go on with God's new ways, okay? It's easy. It's free. He'll describe how it works. Take a couple minutes of your time, then he'll let you come right back out into the church service. Your friends and family will wait for you, okay? So if you guys just make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Come on, let's shout praise to the Lord that he's worthy of. Let's shake the foundations of the earth. God is good. Hallelujah. Woo!